Beyond both of these two points, which result from Eve's faulty understanding of God's word, that is, the generalization of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil into the category of benign trees and the lowering of the transgression barrier in her mind, it must also be said that neither eventuality would have been of much effect if Eve had not lost her fear of God. What happened in her case is most important to note because it is a pattern for all of her children ever since. Ignorance, complacency and lust often combine to lead us into sin, and that was certainly what took place at the fall. Eve's relative ignorance of what God had said, combined with her relative complacency about what the consequences of disobeying God might be made for a very weak shield of faith with which to meet the devil's attack. When challenged on her uncertain knowledge and assured that there would be no consequences, the prospect of becoming godlike was more than enough of a temptation to kindle her lust and strip away her meagre defences. This is the way the devil always works. He observes the chinks in our armour, our ignorance of the word or God, our disbelief, our doubts, our nonchalance about following in the footsteps of Christ, in general or on particular points, and then, armed with this critical scouting report, he attacks, providing false information, false assurances, and tempting us, or frightening us, right when and where we are at our weakest. The devil had a file on Adam too. Just as Satan had correctly discerned the most effective way to induce Eve to throw away her perfect life for a hollow promise and a vain hope, so he had shrewdly observed Adam's main point of vulnerability, Eve. Men in love have been writing poetry to and about the objects of their affections for millennia, but it is often overlooked that the very first poem in human history was written by Adam on the occasion of the Lord God's presentation to him of his wife. And Adam said, This now is bone from my bones and flesh from my flesh. She shall be called woman because from man she was taken. Genesis 2.23 this couplet, in Hebrew poetic form, effectively encapsulates for us Adam's enthusiasm for this captivating new creature. No English translation can easily reflect the beauty, simplicity, and wittiness of this poem. For example, Adam's clever naming of the woman, Isha, is an elegant paranomasia on the word man, Ish, derived by adding a feminine ending to it, the sort of thing which cannot easily be duplicated in our own tongue, even though the words man and woman are similarly close. Adam was clearly motivated to do more than say thank you to God and hello to the woman. For this grand occasion, he mobilized his considerable verbal talents to create an entirely new mode of expression, poetry, providing us with an exquisite and graceful first specimen of this entirely new genre. Obviously, Eve inspired him, and why not? Of all the marriages that have since transpired in the history of our race, this is the only one of which we can say of the bride and groom that they were a perfect match for each other, because God himself made the match, making the bride specifically for the groom. Nor could there be any more perfect location for a honeymoon than the Garden of Eden. Eve and Adam both, moreover, besides living in a perfect place, were themselves perfect, with no possible source of rancor, division, or estrangement save one, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. When Adam returned to the center of the garden, after an enjoyable day of observing and classifying Eden's flora and fauna, no doubt, his expectation of another blissful homecoming to the woman he so adored was quickly overturned. The Bible does not record for us the scene when Eve met him that day, but we can be sure that Adam realized immediately that all was not right in Eden, and relatively certain that he, with his exceptional intellect, was quick to apprehend that Eve had eaten of the forbidden fruit, the only potential source in Eden of trouble, a concept hitherto not experienced. Eating the fruit had instantly rendered Eve spiritually dead, had begun the inevitable process of physical degeneration, and had destined her for the carrying out of God's sentence of death in eternity, barring gracious intervention on his part. However, we need not assume that her body had undergone any noticeable change that would have alerted Adam to the new situation. What did change, though? What had to have changed significantly was her behavior. She was no longer perfect, and she knew it. 
She was now mortal. Death was inevitable, and she knew it. She had been terribly deceived, was alienated from God and the life of God, and knew it. Her eyes were indeed opened, open to all the fear and horror which her new status as a sinner bequeathed. Eve was in grave trouble, racked with guilt, and terribly afraid. The state she must have been in when Adam came home we can scarcely imagine. The mention scripture makes about Adam's part in the fall is that Eve gave some of the fruit also to her husband with her, and he ate. These two short but all-important prepositional phrases speak volumes about Adam's reaction to the alarming situation he encountered upon returning home that evening. The Bible is quite clear that Adam did not eat the forbidden fruit because he was deceived about what the consequences of so doing would be. 1 Timothy 2.14 Adam knew very well that by taking the forbidden fruit from his wife's hand and eating it as she had done, he too would suffer the threefold death whose initial consequences he could plainly see being played out in the woman he loved. Confronted by the love of his life, his perfect soulmate, weeping inconsolably and having passed irrevocably beyond the pale of paradise, Adam now faced an impossible decision. How could he possibly desert the one person who made him complete, his own flesh and bone? She was helpless, desperate, and in dire need. How could he just turn his back on her and walk away? The twin phrases, to her husband with her, make it clear enough that such was essentially Adam's thinking. He was her husband and would stay with her. Adam did not flee at the sight of his fallen wife. He did not separate himself from her for a time to think things through. He did not consult God about the situation. Adam's compassion for this woman he loved so deeply was such that he stayed with her, consoled her, listened to her, gave in to her, and ate the fruit. Adam was not bullied into it. He was not nagged into it. He was not tricked into it. Contemplating the possibility of a life without Eve, and with his heart breaking to help her, he cast his lot in with her, and thus joined her in death. The romantic and noble aspect of Adam's decision should not inspire us. He was every bit as wrong as Eve. In fact, his conduct was the more culpable, because he knew exactly what he was doing. Both of our first parents betrayed God, Eve in ignorance, Adam in cognizance, and both transgressed for essentially the same reason, failure to believe and trust him. Eve was deceived about the nature and the content of what he had said. Adam failed to trust him, failed to believe that for a God who could create an Eve, nothing would be impossible. We are, of course, not told what would have happened or might have happened, had Adam waited on the Lord instead of immediately trying to solve Eve's problem for her in the only manner he could devise, that is, by joining her in her sin, but with the entire Bible as our guide, the one thing we can say for certain is that nothing is impossible for God. By assuming, as Adam may have done, that his added sinfulness would force God to re-evaluate, the first man stepped into exactly the same trap of arrogance, the same false assurance that had originally trapped the devil, that is, assuming himself to be irreplaceable. 